is not persuasion or evangelism, though it may well be the study of persuasion and, van and, 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 and evangelism. Its point is knowledge. It is completely irrelevant to the good library whether, as an institution, it shares or promotes your core values or mine, or the Attorney General's, or Saddam Hussein's. The library is always an instrument of choice, and the choice is always yours, not your elected or designated leaders. It is right that the library should want to have everything. It is also right that the library should want to have its opposite. With every week that passes, the world grows more diverse, less tolerant, more micro-divided, more networked, and the explanations of what happens in it become harder to judge exactly even as the shrieks of outrage against relativism uttered by those who are frustrated by the lack of simplicity that the library gloriously stands for, even as these cries rise against the voices of reason and reflection like floodwaters against a rock. Then out come the terrible simplifiers. And then their terrible simplicities begin. And people preach barbarism like George Bush promising everyone a religious crusade. Of course, if such people were historically literate, if they had some idea, however vague, of what superstition and murder drove the real crusades, if they knew what lay underneath the white tunic with the red cross, and if they had any idea what an idiot's tale the fictions of chivalry attached to them were, they might not invoke them. Or might they not? One of the most repellent moments that followed upon September 11 was when the evangelist Jerry Falwell, friend of presidents and crass double insult to the names of Christian pity and human intelligence. <laughs> Opine to his flock that the destruction of the World Trade Center was foreordained, part of je jealous Jehovah's revenge for the sodomy and fornication for which New Yorkers were world-renowned. Um, I mean, I watched, I live in Soho, and I watched the World Trade Center go over, along with a lot of sodomites and fornicators, though I've never taken an exact count. And we will never know how many sodomites and fornicators perished in the cleansing fire of our Qaeda that day, but we do, we do know that when his thought brought down public outrage upon his head, Falwell tried to weasel out of it, claiming that he had been quoted out of context, the retroactive excuse of every liar, bigot and villain since people began scratching messages on clay tablets in Mesopotamia and media began. But then, of course, Falwell has a lot of friends. You sure as hell didn't hear old praise God bare bones Ashcroft denouncing him for that. Liberals like me have difficulty getting to grips with fundamentalists like that, let alone with their Islamic equivalents. We appear to live on different planets with different laws of matter and gravitation. What is automatically clear to them is not necessarily so to you or me. The fundamentalist tends to think in terms of cosmic struggles, warfare on a huge scale between absolute good and absolute evil. Everything 
in the vicinity of the Death Star is related to absolutes, which is why the President's nattering about the axis of evil made sense to some Americans but sounded perfectly nuts to me. Even allowing for the fact that his grasp of English seems normally a trifle shaky. Um, in the fundamentalist view, whatever lies between the absolutes, in other words, reality to most of us, is nothing more than a mask for the essentially cosmic and eternal nature of this struggle, which is fated to end in permanent world domination by either Christ or Allah. This eschatological point of view can justify any insanity, any cruelty, any murder in the name of history, and of course, any censorship in the name of virtue. The anti-abortion activist can demonstrate how pro-life he is by killing some doctors and nurses. The Hamas act activist knows that the front line and the struggle against Israeli oppression runs through the heart of every Jew and that there are no innocent bystanders and there can be none and so all civilians could equally be killed without remorse. The follower of that ugly fanatic, the Rabbi Kahan, knows that the Intifada goes back to biblical times and that the only good Palestinian is a dead Palestinian. And both sides know that there is no reason for coexistence and no biblical sanction for it. Because the Old Testament, with Jehovah's genocidally primitive instructions to the chosen people to root up and annihilate their territorial rivals in the Middle East, is the blueprint, and it's right there in the Bible. Under its ancient and abiding pattern, war is the natural condition of spiritual man, and there is no escape from it. The whole world is at war, now and forever, proclaimed Osama bin Laden in his fatwa delivered in February 1998, just before the destruction of the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. And your president took up a similar cry after the World Trade Center was destroyed. War is no longer territorial and national. It is ideological and spiritual. We don't want to seize territory by war. We just want to wipe out the heresies that inhabit it. And because we are all in it, everything about us must be known. It must be transparent to higher authority. We must be prepared to move books and bedding into the panopticon made ready for us by our own fundamentalists where a jealous and all-seeing God whose earthly incarnations are people like Ashcroft and, uh, Ashcroft and the staff of the FBI will judge our fitness to receive certain kinds of knowledge. Just as the representatives of Allah east of here make similar decisions on behalf of their faithful. It is the growing likeness, embryonic yet, but gathering strength, it seems, between those there and these here that gives me the willies. <laughs> Governments that invoke God in the name of the people tend to behave in disturbingly similar ways. And whenever I hear someone claiming that God is on his, or more rarely on her side, we do right to smell a familiar odor of repression in the making. And of course, the overriding irony is that not so long ago, when Russia was in Afghanistan, another president, whose name was also Bush, was heaping praise upon the heads of Afghan guerrilla resistors, notably the pious and freedom-loving Osama bin Laden and his comrades. Americans love to talk about their traditions of freedom, and so they should. The shaping of American liberty is one of the great achievements of human society 
in human history.